In this video, we're going to take a look at how to draw a simple random sample using Excel and how to apply the systematic stratified and cluster sampling methods. So statistics is built on a foundation of randomness and this implies that we make use of the lack of predictability or the lack of a pattern in the events that we observe so that they can give us a good representation of the population behavior. So that means that when we take a sample, then the sample which is random is representative of the larger population at hand. So in this case, for us to make use of the sampling distribution techniques, then we have to ensure that randomness and what we also refer to as representativeness is imposed in our sampling techniques so that the samples that we get are random and they are a representation of our population. The first method is the simple random sampling method where every element from the population has an equal chance of being selected. There are various methods on how to obtain a simple random sample. The first method consists of drawing numbers from a hat. Now, in order for you to use this method, you need to know all the elements from the population and assign each element a number. Place the numbers in a hat and select one number after the other randomly until you have all the elements for your sample. Then once you have these numbers, you can identify those elements from the population that are now going to consist of your sample. In the second method, you can make use of the random function on the scientific calculator. The third method consists of using the RAND function in Excel. And with the RAND function, a uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1 is returned for every element. However, since there is no seed value that is given to the RAND function, then every time the worksheet is calculated, a new number is generated. So in order for these numbers to remain fixed, then on your Excel tab, you're going to click on formula. Then you click on calculation options and you click on the manual option so that your numbers are going to remain fixed and not change every time the worksheet is calculated. Similarly, in Excel, we can make use of the random number generation tool that also generates random numbers between 0 and 1. And you can make use of a seed value that is going to fix the random numbers that are generated so that they don't keep changing. Now in section 6.1 of this practical guide, there's more information concerning how to use the random number generation tool. Now let's take a look at how to draw a simple random sample from a population of elements by using Excel. So the first step is to assign a random number to each population element, and you can make use of the RAND function in Excel that assigns a random number between 0 and 1, or the random number generation tool that is found in the data analysis tool pack. So if you make use of the RAND function, be sure to fix these values by clicking on the formula tab at the top of your Excel sheet and clicking on the calculation option and then selecting the manual option so that your random numbers do not keep changing whenever the worksheet is recalculated. After you've done this, select both columns of your population elements and your random numbers and sort them with respect to your random numbers so that now your random numbers will be in ascending order. Then you can proceed and select the n elements that you want for, for your sample with the smallest random numbers. In this example, we are interested in drawing a simple random sample of size 10 from a population of 200 students. And we're going to make use of the RAND function in Excel to assign a random number to each student. 
And then we're going to select the 10 students with the smallest random numbers. So in this example, assume that students are numbered from one to 200. So in an empty cell, we're going to type equals ran with empty brackets, and this will generate the first random number. When we double click, it will populate the rest of the columns such that we have 200 random numbers. So now we have our column of random numbers, and as you can see, each population element has an assigned random number. So we're going to fix these random numbers by clicking on the formula tab, calculation option, and selecting the manual option so that our values do not change once we've sorted. Now, after we have sorted our random numbers, we can see that the first 10 random numbers that are the smallest are going to give us the first 10 students from our population. So we see that student, the first student that is selected will be student number 144, and the 10th student in our sample will be student 119. Now, if we take a look at the spread of the selected students with respect to the entire population, we see that this spread is completely random and there's no pattern whatsoever. So this shows us that we do have a random sample. So even if two students, were two students who were selected were close to one another, it would still be random because there is no pattern or predictability involved here. So an example would be when we have numbers drawn for a lotto, you see that sometimes you do end up with consecutive numbers drawn one after the other. However, they are still random. The next method is the systematic random sampling method. And this method does have some advantages over the simple random sampling method. The first advantage is that it's much simpler to use and more convenient because of how the selection is done. And secondly, if your data is at risk of having been manipulated through ordering, then this method is more of an advantage since we have a random selection point that is chosen as a starting point for us to pick the elements for our sample. So how this method works is that you have a population of elements and you decide what your sample size is going to be then you calculate what we call a sampling interval, and this will be the population size divided by the sample size. Then you select a random starting point, and every kth element after that is going to be included in your sample. So for example, in this, in, in this population that we have, you can see that we have 12 elements because each one of them has been numbered and we want a sample of size four. So that means that our selection or rather our sample interval will be 12 divided by four, and that gives us a value of K equals to three. So if we start selecting from the second person labeled number two here, then we are going to take every third person after that. So that will mean that we take the fifth person, the eighth person, and the 11th person. Similarly, in this population here at the bottom, you can see that we have 15 elements or other 15 um, objects. So if we want a sample of size five, that means that our selection interval or our sample interval will be three. So if we start selecting from the first person, then we are going to select the fourth after that one, the fourth person, which will be the third after that. Then we select person number seven, number 10, and finally the 13th person. So in this case, the selection point is completely random and it's not predictable. So this increases our chances of having a subset that contains randomly selected objects. So think of an example where you'd like to have a sample of customers entering a grocery store such that they can take part in a survey that you're carrying out. So we may not have 
the number of the population elements at present, but we may estimate these population numbers from previous information, say from the information of the previous day. So if we know the population size or the number of customers who entered the store yesterday, and we want a certain number that we're going to consider our sample, then we are going to take that population number, say it was 40, and if I'm interested in a sample of size 10, then it will be 40 divided by 10, and I have an interval of four. So which means that we select our first customer as a random person entering the store, and every fourth person after that is going to be taken as an element for our sample, and we stop once we get the 10 people that we are looking for. The next method we're going to look at is the stratified random sampling method. So let's consider an example where you're interested in studying the consumption of fast foods by males who live in Hatfield. So your population would be all the males who live in Hatfield. Now considering that we want to look at how this consumption varies with respect to the different ages, then we want to make sure that the sample that we take is going to be representative of the population with respect to the different ages. So in order for us to make sure that every age group is going to be well represented in our sample, we first of all need to take our population elements and place them into age groups that we are going to construct. So we may have an age group, suppose, of 0 to 10 years, 11 to 20 years, 21 to 30 years, etc., and place each element into only a single age group. Then from those age groups, we are going to take a sample that is proportional to the population at hand, and collectively, all those samples are going to give us a sample that is representative of the entire population. That is how stratified random sampling works. You start off with a population, then you divide the population elements into strata that are mutually exclusive. So that means that an element can only be placed in a single strata. Then from there, we take a sample from each strata that is going to be proportional to the representation of that group within the population. Then we take all the samples that we have collected from each and every strata and together we get the sample that is going to be representative of our population. Now the technique to carry out the stratified random sampling as well as how to determine the number of elements that we should sample from each strata is clearly outlined in section 6.1.2 in your practical guide. The next method we're going to look at is the cluster sampling method. So let's suppose that there is an airline that is interested in taking a survey on its customers on the level of satisfaction based on their travel experience. Now, this particular airline offers flights three times a day from Joburg to Cape Town at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and at 4 p.m. So they might decide to group their customers based on their flight times. So there will be a group of those who took an 8 a.m. flight, another for those who took the 1 p.m. flight, and another for those who took the 4 p.m. flight. So then one of these groups is randomly chosen to be representative of the entire population who flew on that particular day. And they will then take the survey and the information that they use will be that they give will be used to generalize the level of satisfaction for the entire group that flew on that particular day. So in this case, we can see that the population is all the customers who flew on a particular day and naturally occurring clusters would be the different flight times, which would be 8 p.m., 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. And after that, we randomly select any one of those clusters to be in a sample that is going to be representative of the entire population. So in this case, the difference between stratified and cluster sampling is that when it comes to stratified sampling, we have our different strata based on similar characteristics that are used to 
divide the elements into only one particular group and then we sample from each group and those samples will make a representative sample of the population whereas in cluster sampling we have naturally occurring groups such that those elements that are in either cluster are going to be representative of the population so one of the clusters is selected and it becomes the sample that will represent the entire population. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the difference between a population parameter and sample statistic, point estimator and point estimate, as well as how to calculate the point estimates for the population mean mu, population standard deviation sigma and population proportion p, and also how to calculate and interpret sampling errors for the sample mean, sample standard deviation, and sample proportion.